You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Sorry for the, uh, the, the, late, um, the late show. I took the day off, so it's basically the weekend. So I get lazy on the weekends, man. I mean busy. I mean I meant busy. Those are the words. But anyways, we are just going to continue on with what we did yesterday, because I actually really, really liked it. I don't know about you, but I thought it was pretty cool. So as I said, um, in the Facebook group, and there's going to be another one, we might actually do it today, so maybe that's not true. It depends how long this is going to take. But the question was posed by me. Let's hear some bold team predictions for the Packers in 2019. I got several responses. I want to go through these responses and um, see what we come up with. And I can already tell... As nice and thoughtful and measured as yesterday's were, I feel like these aren't quite that way. So I don't know if I'm going to have quite as many comments, but we'll just see how this goes. Um, A little update on that PFF giveaway thing, by the way. Mr. The Jack on Twitter did reach out. I knew he'd come through and I wouldn't have to track him down. He reached out to me and I was able to get him all set up with that and he's already been poking around, so... um, Again, thanks a lot for all those iTunes reviews. That's very, very awesome. And I suppose just for the heck of it, because there's no way it's going to happen, if we get to 300 before the season starts, I'll give away a Game Pass subscription. How does that sound? NFL Game Pass, watch all the games and all that stuff. Same rules. Go make it happen. Otherwise, um, if you have any questions or comments for the show, 608-501-0718. Otherwise, click on the link of links to be able to score some sweet Packernet merchandise Uh, support the podcast, get in the Facebook group, all that stuff is there for your perusing pleasure. But let us now take our break, and um, we will be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have. Because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, so let's get started right off the bat. Anthony in the Facebook group says, The Packers beat the Lions for the first time in two years. I kind of feel like Anthony's taking shots here, and I mean that in both ways. He's kind of being a little aggressive toward the Packers. Also think he might be a little drunk. But no, it's been, um, I mean, it's been a rough stretch with the Lions. But it's not so much the Lions, in my opinion. It's just the Packers over the last two years. Two years ago, Aaron Rodgers was hurt. So there's that. 
And then last year, the team was complete trash, and especially toward the end of the year, and we didn't really face the Lions until late in the year. Our first game against the Lions was in October, and then we faced them in December and got blown out 31 to nothing. I will say it's a little bit sad, though. This is the first time the Lions have gone on a four-game um, win streak against the Packers since their four-game streak from 82 to 83. Since then, there's only four times the Lions have beat the Packers twice in a row or more. That is, up until this four-game streak here. Bottom line is the Packers have absolutely dominated the Pack the Lions since forever. Just thought I'd throw that out there. And don't, don't misunderstand. I know he said he believes the Packers are going to win, but you need to understand he's picking on us, man. But that's all right. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything that I can glean from the schedule. We've, we've faced the Lions in Week 6 at home. I think if we lose that game, I'm going to be worried about that. Because the Lions are like any other divisional opponent. Even when they're not great, you know, as a team, you still worry that they're going to win one. I think week six is kind of the biggest one. It's it's early enough that if things aren't going great, it's not full on this everybody super depressed, right? So if, if, if we don't get off to a super hot start, they're still like, we can do this, right? We got to turn this around, and the Lions can be that team that you can turn it around on. It's also a home game, so there's that. But it's not too early to the point where it's like, we don't even know what we're doing yet. By week six, you should have a pretty good understanding of things. So I, I like the Packers' chances in week six. Week 17 is just up in the air. It just depends what the Packers are at that point and what the Lions are at that point. I, I don't have any idea what, what the NFL is going to look like by week 17. But I think week six is going to be kind of important. And important for the team as a whole. I mean, I, there's so many variables here, but... It's one of those, just like last year, there were certain games we just had to win, and a couple of them we did not. That wasn't great. Not only was it not great as far as the standings at the end of the year, it was not great for morale, it was not a good indication of things to come, all that. But sure, I will jump on this bold take. And as Sean Luke said in the comment underneath, I think both games, the Packers winning both games would be more of a bold prediction, which I think is true. Kyle says, top five defense leads the team to a division title, not the offense. So I think this is going to be similar to the Devontae Adams thing where um, I like the Packers' chances of improving their defense, but top five is just, it is kind of like the thing yesterday with Blake Martinez. It's not so much that I don't think Blake Martinez can be really good, but when we're talking top five-ish, it's like, eesh, or top ten or whatever it is. It's just, it goes beyond being a very good defense, right? Top 10 is very good. I mean, the 10th best defense is going to be a pretty tough defense to go up against. Top 5 is is crazy. I think with that said, however, it's not entirely impossible. It just kind of depends which teams are going to stay. Because when I look at, I just go to PFF and look at the top defenses, there's no guarantee that these guys are going to stay at the top. You know, the Chicago Bears, I think, are probably going to stay above the Packers. I don't know that, but I would assume that. The Patriots should be good but I don't exactly know how good. The Texans have a real good defense, but they also have a very volatile defense. For example, last year the Texans were 18th, right? The injuries or whatever the case may be, it just, it's kind of all over the place. As a matter of fact, as I'm looking at this, I don't know if there's one team outside of the Eagles that is top five in 2018 that was top five in 2017. Um, The Rams, I I just, I don't know about the Rams, man. I'm They've got some good pieces, but they got a lot of deficiencies. You know, they've got maybe the best pass rusher in the NFL right in the middle of that defense. But I don't know about their outside linebackers. I don't know about their inside linebackers. Eh. I'm not saying they're not good. I'm just saying, do I know for sure they're going to be better than the Packers if the Packers have a really good defense? I would guess they are, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible to the point where it's like, well, the Packers can't be top five because we know definitively the Rams will have a better defense. The Eagles are probably going to have a really good defense. Um, the Ravens lost a ton of players, so I don't know if they're going to stay there. The Saints, I think, are still going to have a pretty good defense. The Jaguars are going to have a good defense. Um, Titans could go either way. The Vikings could go either way. Um, so it's, it's kind of twofold. On one hand, there's no one team outside of you know maybe the Bears, the Jaguars, Eagles, maybe Patriots, whatever in your mind is just a steady, solid, really good defense. There aren't too many that we're gonna that I'm gonna say I know they're gonna be better. 
which is to Kyle's credit. But on the other hand, there's a lot of teams that is going to be hard to leap over. Right, the other side of that is, is how many teams do you know are going to be worse than the Packers? You know, the 49ers had the 32nd ranked defense last year. I don't know that the Packers are going to have a better defense than the 49ers. They've got a lot of pieces. The Raiders are going to be trash. Um, the Browns are ranked 27th. They might have a very good defense. Um, let's see, the Lions were 23rd. They can and probably will improve. Um, the Panthers... The Colts were pretty low, but we saw what happened with them at the end of the season. The Seahawks are losing a ton of talent, but they could be up really high. Um, the Chiefs, we'll see what happens with their new defensive coordinator. They've paid a bunch of money for this pass rusher. They've got a really, really talented guy in the middle of that defensive uh, the, the D-line. The Chargers have you know Bosa and Ingram. The Redskins have always got a pretty stout defense. The Cowboys have got some great pieces. Just on and on and on. The Bills and the Jets and the Broncos and the Vikings and the Titans and the Jaguars, all of them. So I, I, it's kind of just a free-for-all, um, and it depends which way things fall for each team. Statistically, it's going to be hard for the Packers to get up there, but as I've been saying all along, it really just becomes a question of, um, you know, is it a hit or a miss on each candidate? And if it's a series of hits, in other words, Zadarius continues and actually gets better than last year Preston is as good or better than last year Gary is a a big hit you know Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels we already know what they bring Kyler can kind of keep bringing that same thing he brought last year if Jair takes another step and King takes a step and and Josh Jackson takes a step and Savage is a good player and Amos stays the same suddenly all of a sudden it, it gets to the point where top five if they're not top five it's weird if all these players hit it, you know, Oren Burks becomes a quality player and, and, and Blake can, you know, continue to play well and, and grow in the system. Suddenly there's no question because Pettin isn't a weak link. But again, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's it, each one of these things in my mind is flip a coin. And what, in my mind, for your prediction to come true, it would have to fall heads about, you know, 10 out of 11 times. And I'm just not going to put money on that. Um, the other part of the question or the the statement, I guess, top five defense leads the team to a division title, not the offense. In other words, the defense will be better than the offense. I hope not, but maybe. And the only reason I say I hope not isn't because I don't want the defense to be dominant. I just think this team runs through Aaron Rodgers, and it always will. And that's not a bad thing because it's the NFL in 2019. If your team doesn't run through your quarterback, I don't know if I like your team very much. You know, what are the Saints without Drew Brees? What are the Patriots without Tom Brady? What are the Chiefs without Mahomes? I mean, just a a great team with a great offense led by a great quarterback complemented by a dominant defense is how you win a Super Bowl. I'm not going to complain if the defense is better than the offense. I I just, if you just told me that as just outright, hey, just so you know, the defense is going to be better than the offense, my fear would be the offense is still really bad and therefore the team isn't going to be very good. But again, what Kyle is saying is top five defense. So I don't know that that means the offense is bad. Either way, I'm <laughs> it's a little too optimistic for me, but I really, really hope it's true. Dustin says the Packers exceed expectations, walk away with the North, and a first-round bye. I don't hate it, primarily because I think if you win the North, winning a or getting a first-round bye is, is, I don't want to say it's guaranteed, but it's a tough division. And if you're the best in the best division, although, you know, maybe if you have a really good division, you're kind of getting banged up by the other guys, whatever. You lose a couple of those games, it kind of hurts you. But I could definitely see whatever team ends up winning the North could have a first-round bye. But historically, what is that, at least 12 wins? I mean, if we can get through this gauntlet with three or four losses, that's incredible. I mean, we, we would have to... Let's see, if we got three losses, who are they going to be to? You know, it, it seems insane but when you look at the schedule as hard as some of these seem i don't know the bears week one has got to be one of the toughest games it just is the vikings week two could be very very difficult in both scenarios though i could definitely see a win the broncos week three could be tough but i just don't know how much i like a first year head coach who is a defensive coordinator trying to get joe flacco to win a game on the road everything about that sentence just makes me think no (laughs) nope 
I know the defense is going to be good. I know they got Von Miller and Chubb, and it's going to be horrible and all that stuff, but I just cannot see the Packers losing based on what I just said. Everything about that screams loss. Philadelphia Eagles, week four. Tough, but... I mean, that, that that right there is the really all these games are the epitome of why the Packers need to be on their game. You can't play these games where you're bad but still luck into a few. This week, this, this, this first few weeks in the schedule, you can't fake it till you make it. You can't just kind of, we kind of get it. We're kind of a little bit better. We're compensating by being still a bad team by a couple little trick play. Dude, you got to be a good football team. If you're going to beat the Bears on the road, come back and beat the Vikings, Vic Fangio's defense, and then the Eagles with their offense and defense with you know Wentz and that whole defensive line and everything else that they got going on, and then go on the road to face the Cowboys. I mean, if we get through that gauntlet, ending with the Cowboys there in Week 5 with one loss... I'm feeling real good about this season. From there, though, Lions should be a win. Raiders should be a win. Chiefs on the road could be real tough, but I just, I'm standing by what I said before that I really feel like this can and should be a win. I don't respect their defense at this point. I got to re examine that. I didn't, you know, their defense was garbage last year. So if our offense can be a top tier, we're talking top five ish offense, which I don't think is that crazy of a thing to say. The Saints are up there, the Rams are up there, the Chiefs are up there. Okay, then what? I can see the, and again, it just comes back to what it is the defense taking that big step with all those guys really hitting? Is the offense actually overcoming all the garbage from last year because we've got a better play caller and the, just all this different stuff? It, are we meeting that potential? If so, our offense should be able to overcome that defense without problem. Our defense should be able to stop the Kansas City Chiefs. Remember, I don't know exactly what the situation is with Hill. It sounds like he's going to be playing, which is not great for a couple reasons. Number one, he sounds like a scumbag. Number two, he's very, very good, which is going to make it hard to stop. But it's going to be a good enough defense to be able to get some stops, get some sacks, get some picks. It just is. As good as he was with these magical throws... He had a lot of interceptions. That's the one area in which he is not Aaron Rodgers. He's throwing way too many interceptions to be Aaron Rodgers. If you've got a defense that has got a ton of premier talent and you're able to generate pressure and you're able to disguise things, you're going to make some stuff happen. In a weird way, and, and maybe it's just because it's the Packers and this is just the way it works, I'm much more scared of the Bears and the Vikings and the Broncos and the Eagles and the Cowboys than I am of the Chiefs. Because historically, I'm not talking about the last two years, the last two years... Pretty much anybody can beat up on the Packers. Historically, the Packers and Aaron Rodgers can go toe-to-toe with those top-tier offenses. It's the it's the defenses that can stifle the offense. Those are the ones that we have struggled with. Beyond that, the Chargers, I don't know what they're going to be, but that could be a tough matchup. The Panthers, tough defense, great running back, capable enough quarterback. I, I don't have a huge amount of respect to some people. I don't see him as a top-10 quarterback, but capable enough as far as his arm talent. And then as a runner, he's just devastating to go up against 49ers will have to see I mean it, it, this whole schedule is so hard because almost every game it's like I could absolutely see us losing this game but I could absolutely see us winning this game so for us to get a first round by and get 12 wins I think it goes beyond the schedule and, and some of these teams that we thought were good or thought would be good aren't very good this needs to be yeah, this is it, man. This this is this is legit. Like this scheme is just dynamite. We're confusing defenses and of course Aaron Rodgers being at his level. Like everything's just clicking and the defense has to be on it too. And if that's the case, if we get a fir- so let me throw my own little thing in here. If the Packers get a first round bye, I think the Packers are maybe the favorites to win the Super Bowl. How about that? Because we're already going to be above the Bears and the Vikings and the Lions obviously. So you can eliminate them from the top tier. I mean the Patriots, I don't know. But just seeing Aaron Rodgers decimate all of these defenses in this new, modern offense with the defense doing what the defense must be doing in order to get us 12 or 13 wins, I just, I could, I, I, I yes, that's that's what I'm going to say. But I, I hope, man, I'm so excited for this season. I just, I want it to happen so bad. Just give me one of those two things. I mean, if, if, if it's only one, it's going to be disappointing because I want both. But give me one of those two. Either the offense just 
boom, it's back. We're, 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 it's 2014, 2013, 2012, 11, 10, all over again. Aaron Rodgers is carving people up because McCarthy's, you know, got his whole thing. And, like, you know, historically that's what he did. Now LaFleur is just that way, right? It's just, it's a modern offense, and he just has brought us up to speed, and Aaron Rodgers learns it, and he just starts using it to carve up defenses. We're back on top. That or the defense is just dominant. Like, it's not just this is a good defense for the Packers. Like, this is just scary. I'm talking 2017 Vikings, 2018 Bears. Unrealistic, but you get what I'm saying, right? Really, really like, oh, no, I don't want to face this defense kind of good. Just give me one. I really want two, but, I mean, I, I'm i just so... Uh, I don't want neither. <laughs> I'm so scared of neither. Peter says... Roger is not getting sacked for 10 straight games. Man, you, you guys all got together and are doing shots, I think. I think all of you guys got together and were like, hey, you want to do this as a group, like a group project? And then you guys just got carried away with the alcohol, and now now this has just devolved into chaos. 10, <laughs> ten games. N- wow. Aaron Rodgers last year did not have one game without a sack. N- not one. He only had three games with only one sack. Granted, this is pretty bad. 49 sacks on the season. But, um, 10 games, huh? The last time Aaron Rodgers was not sacked in a game, and I don't, I'm not even going to count that. That doesn't even count because he played, he had four dropbacks, so we're skipping that one, was week 12 of 2016 against the Philadelphia Eagles. No sacks, um... In fact, it was a decent little stretch there. Uh, Week 11, two sacks, then zero against Philly, one against Houston, one against Seattle. That was a pretty decent effort by the offensive line for a while there. But that's it. There was a second game, um, week five against the Giants, not a single sack was given up. So in three years, I guess we'll call it two and a half years because he was injured, two games total. We'll just call it two, two years. Maybe one week a year where he doesn't get sacked. I feel pretty confident in saying that uh, this is a no-go. i tell you what, though. If it happens, you deserve all the things. Because that is the boldest prediction that has ever been made that came true. Just just aiming high. Sean Luke says top 10 defense. I mean, I could pretty easily get behind that. Um, as I've said a thousand times, top 10 is basically just top third. That basically just means you're you're pretty good, right? I mean, if you're top 10, you're pretty good. If you're 10 to... 10 to 21-ish, you're mediocre. And if you're lower than that, you're pretty bad. So I would hope, with all the additions and all the young guys taking steps and all the second-year defense, everything, the draft picks, Gary and Savage, Kadar, I guess, if we're not top 10, it's going to be just a hair disappointing. I'll, I'll be okay if it's like 11 or 12, but, man, if it's like 20 again, I'm not going to be super happy. Joshua coming in hot. Realistic prediction: Bears still suck. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna double down on that one. It's a little bit unfair because they always will, no matter what. The year in which they win the Super Bowl, probably long after I'm dead. But uh, in that year, they will still suck. In fact, so it's kind of like saying water's wet. I don't, I don't know. Jorgen, guessing that's how you say that. Jorgen from Norway says Packers go undefeated in the division. That's another one of those predictions where if it happens. It just, it's very telling that it's, it's not even so much that, well, then the, maybe the division was bad. I still don't buy it. Even when the division isn't super great, um, which has happened several times, whereas the Packers basically being the Patriots and everyone else's garbage, it still is pretty telling. That's still a really, really hard thing to do. If that happens, that's telling us everything we need to know. This is a very real team. Even if the Bears' defense completely falls off and Trubisky doesn't take a step and the Vikings continue basically what they were last year and the Lions were what they were last year, that wouldn't be the best division that the Packers are going up against. But still, week one, when everything's kind of crazy and volatile and nobody knows what's really going on, in Soldier Field, I, I, I mean, that's a very bold prediction. And again, that's very telling that the Packers are for real. Some of the hardest games are going to be week one and two. Um, the reason I say two, even though that's at home against the Vikings, is just because things are so volatile. The Vikings have got a better understanding, especially the defensive unit has got a better understanding of what's going on than the Packers 
offensive unit does. However, the Vikings offense is also under a new offensive coordinator, so they've got to kind of go through that same learning process the Packers do. Um, otherwise, the last three weeks, you got the Bears again, which is going to be tough. You got the Vikings in Minnesota. You got the Detroit. Or th- you got the Detroit's in Detroit. So that last three weeks is really going to put this theory to the test. But I look forward to it, man. It starts with week one. This, this, a lot of predictions are going to fall apart right after week one. <laughs> Joel says seven and nine. Got another one taking shots here. To be fair, though, <laughs> in both cases, they're kind of compliments because that would technically mean the Packers got better. It would mean the Packers are still terrible, and the uh, Matt Lafleur experiment, at least in year year one, wasn't very good, and Mike Pettin's defense didn't get all that much better. Um, because as I've said, I think just on paper last year, which wasn't as good of a roster, it was a nine win team this year being improved. I mean, we can start at nine, go to maybe it's a 10 win team again on paper, which doesn't really mean anything, but that should be a baseline expectation is around 10 wins. Seven and nine is just garbage. That's way underperforming what you should do. Just if you're on cruise control, Justin screamed Super Bowl, crying face, let's go again, screaming lots of exclamation points. So Justin is is drinking Red Bulls. By the way, why didn't you guys invite me to this party? Sounds like it was a lot of fun. There's screaming and there's other things that are happening. Maybe I wanted to come. I don't know. But yeah, I'll, you know, let's just let's do it, man. Super Bowl. No real comments on that. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I can reiterate. Um, Aaron Rodgers is going to need to make this offense go he's going to need to be able to work within the offense the defense is going to have to complement the offense so basically both things me saying I hope we get one of those two things that's not going to be good enough we need to have two of the two not saying top five in both categories Aaron Rodgers has to be able to distribute the ball the run game has to be working defense has to complement the offense in other words they're not just going to get blown out to the point where you know you've got Aaron Rodgers running up the score 30 and then the defense comes up and scores, you know, 28 or they're, they're always nipping at our heels. Either they win scoring 45 or they lose scoring 32 or whatever, you know, if the Packers score 35 or whatever, that's not good enough. That's going to end up just being what 2016 all over again with the Atlanta Falcons, where it's the first team to kick a field goal loses. Got to stop that, man. That's just not good enough, right? The, the Falcons were a similar team that year. What happened? They go to the Super Bowl, their offense dominates the Patriots, and their defense completely drops the ball, and they lose the Super Bowl in spectacular fashion. Gotta have the defense. Andy says 2,000-yard receivers and a 1,000-yard rusher. I'm already on board with the rusher. I think Devontae as a 1,000-yard receiver is pretty solidified pending injuries. The question is, is there going to be one more, which I think is kind of where the bold prediction comes in. But I, I, it's not that crazy, right? 2018, it didn't happen, but the, the offense was not good. None of the other re- receivers were very good. 2017, the injury. 2016, the last time this was a functioning team, Devontae Adams had 1,214 yards. Jordy Nelson had 1,337. There you go. 2014, uh, Jordy had 1,600. Randall Cobb had 1,400. The bigger issue that I have with this is not that it's impossible. It's a matter of, Right, the, the illustrations were Devontae Adams and Jordy Nelson and Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb. Do we have a 2015 Randall Cobb? Do we have a 20, or excuse me, 2014 Randall Cobb? Do we have a 2016 um, Devontae Adams? Beyond that, if you go back even further and look at teams when we had like four or five wide receivers on the roster, the ball gets distributed a lot more. So it becomes a lot harder for one person, much less two people, to stand out over a thousand yards it's not impossible 2009 Jordy Nelson James Jones Jermichael Finley Donald Driver Greg Jennings Driver and Jennings were over a thousand yards but I think the thing that'll really boost this is if we have a legit number two not a rotation not you know mostly MVS but a good good amount of Geronimo and then a pretty heavy amount of EQ and a little bit of Kumaro and a little bit of Trevor and you know that kind of stuff if we're doing two wide receiver sets a lot more than we have, which is the expectation, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but that is an expectation, and you have, again, one guy that is solidified, if it's 
primarily going to be MVS, then I think there's a, a decent chance, especially when you look at Marquez and his yards per reception, the fact of, of him getting, when he gets the ball, their chunk plays. Um, that's going to help, obviously, him getting up to 1,000-plus yards. Lauren says 12-4 and four NFC champs. Kind of kind of covered that. That's a little more specific, but yeah, that's um, that's when it that's when it gets serious, man. Twelve wins is that that's that in my mind that's the line, right? You know, eleven wins is a really good team. Maybe you get the division. Maybe you get that first round by twelve and four, win the division. We're talking probably a, a good chance. Well, if you win the division, but you you've got a a good chance at that first round by twelve wins is that premier team. That's that's a different level. That's when you start hearing similar to what we heard for about five or pl- five or more years. Every year at the start of the year, the Packers are the favorites. The Packers are the favorites. The Packers are the favorites. That's when the Packers are 12 and four regularly, right? 11, 12, 13 wins. That's a different kind of thing. And if that happens in in Lafleur's first year, oh, no. Am I actually buying that? For our purposes, sure. Would I ever put money down on that? No, I would not. But again, I asked for bold predictions. Patrick says 10 and 6 as long as there are no major injuries. I think that's that's sort of a what I would call a good benchmark. So th- this is actually perfect that they're next to each other. I think 9 wins is sort of disappointing. 9 wins is, you know, we're probably not even in the playoffs at 9 wins. Um, and if we do get into the playoffs, it's one of those things you don't... Anything can happen, you're not feeling super confident. 10 wins, you kind of get to that point where that's that's a decent season. Ten years is a pretty or ten wins is ten and six is a pretty decent season. Um, good chance of making the playoffs, especially when we're talking about first year in the system. A lot of still young guys, second year with Petten, a lot of young guys. You feel like this is for real, and and you know we got a good push, good chance of making a push in the playoffs. But if we don't, we come back next year, and there's no reason to not have anything but optimism. The next level from there would be the twelve wins, and that's when it's like, oh my goodness, this is a this is a scary team. From there, we got Jacob <laughs> saying 13 and three if no major injuries. I think that's the same category as 12 and four. You know, you cross the 12 threshold, and obviously it's better. 13 and three, 12 and two, whatever. 15 and one. It gets better every time. But that's premier team. And I agree. But I add one more caveat. He says 13 and three if there's no major injuries. I say 13 and three if there's no major injuries, and we can hit on these extra on on these free agents and draft picks. We gotta hit on a few of them. We need to hit on a, an offensive lineman. We need at least a better right guard. Um, again, no major injuries, so we're not losing our tackles. We're not losing our quarterback. And then if we can hit on or let, let's see, hit on the safeties, hit on the pass rushers, and improve our corners. I'm going to be okay with this 13 and 3 prediction. Now, I'm asking a lot, right? No major injuries is is a lot in and of itself. Rodgers getting through the season, the tackles getting through the season, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Aaron Jones. But that plus all those additional hits and I I think 13 and 3 is is a reasonable it sounds unreasonable, but I think it's a reasonable expectation. Because I'm allowing three law. I mean, we can lose to the Bears, we can lose to the Chiefs, we can lose to one other team, but we're expecting to not only beat all of these teams that aren't up to this this level of, you know, Aaron Rodgers in a great offense, no major injuries, great defense. I mean, j- just think what it means if, if the safeties hit, meaning Savage is a solid player, Amos is the same guy as it was with the Bears. If the, if the corners all take a step, this is one of the better DB groups in the NFL, not to mention maybe the best pass rushing unit in the NFC North, which has some of the best pass rushers in the NFL. To say that 13-3 and three as a reasonable expectation is unreasonable, I just don't agree. I think if you're that good, which again, it, it, it's it's a matter of I, I doubt we can hit on all these things, but if we can, you got to be hitting that at least 12-win mark because we have Aaron Rodgers, and we have Aaron Jones, and we have LaFleur, and we have Mike Pettin, and we have David Bakhtiari, and Balaga, and Lindsley, and Devontae Adams, and we have Jair, and Josh uh, Jackson, and Kevin King, and Amos, and Savage, and Gary, and Preston, and Zadarius. Expectation is 12 wins for me. Again, that's if they all hit, and if they're all healthy. If it turns out some of these draft picks were not great and these free agent pickups guys regress, you know, Amos, he was only good because he was with the Bears. He regresses. Savage wasn't a great pick. Jair is still our only good corner. You know, Preston 
or Zadarius. One of them just doesn't pan out, and Gary's just not doing very much. He's a four-sack guy. It's just going to be the same old kind of defense, and we're not going to get to that point. Garrett says the secondary leads the league in takeaways. So last year, the league leader, not surprisingly, was Chicago, and by a pretty wide margin, number two was Cleveland, which is surprising. At 31, Chicago had 36. So let's just say Chicago regresses. We're, we're aiming for that 30 takeaway mark. Well, let's, let's say some teams get in 30. So, you know, 31, 32, somewhere in that range. So we're looking at about two picks a game or fumble recoveries or whatever. Two takeaways per game. That's the, when you say it like that, that's when it becomes like, ooh, <laughs> that's a lot. But again, it's, it's the if game, right? If our pass rush is up to the standard of, again, Preston and Zedarius are the same guys. Kenny and Mike Daniels are healthy. Our corners take a step. Our safeties are, you know, Amos is the same guy and Savage is everything that he was built up to be. Two takeaways a game isn't that unreasonable, especially if you get a flurry of three or four in this game and, you know, maybe it compensates for the one takeaway here or the no takeaways there. But just just keep that in the back of your mind. The, the Bears getting 36 takeaways last year was an average of two per game. That's crazy, man. Even even in the Packers' heyday, I don't really remember that. Let's see. Just just go back a little bit just to get an idea of what the most takeaways looks like. In 2017, Baltimore led the league with 34. The second highest was the Chiefs with 26. So if we break 30, we got a shot. And either way, it's going to be close to about two per game. And I think one of the one of the biggest things is going to be to be opportunistic. Something that pretty much everybody is defensive coordinators focus on. But you get up against a guy like Trubisky, you take advantage of that, right? Like the Packers with Jay Cutler. This is your opportunity to, to get those statistics up. Trubisky makes some mistakes. He throws errant passes. Even his, his on tar, even, even guys that are open, it might not be super on target. You got a shot at it. Right? If it's a little bit overthrown, safeties need to be on their ball, on the ball and just aware. Um, 2016, Kansas City, 33, Oakland 30. The next highest was 23. So giant drop off on that one. Oof. 2015, number two was a... Why is Kansas City's number, like, top three every single year? That's crazy. Chiefs are number two at 29. Carolina Panthers had 39 takeaways. Wow. And look at that. 2014, here you go. Green Bay Packers number one. Now, the biggest reason they were number one is because nobody was actually good at takeaways that year. The number two team behind Green Bay had 25 total takeaways. Green Bay led the league with 27. So maybe we, you know do a good job and get lucky. I don't know. But, uh, you know, again, we play the Bears twice. That's two games against Trubisky. Those are opportunities to get some picks, right? Denver Broncos, assuming it's going to be Joe Flacco, probably got some opportunities there. Unfortunately, if you look at the, the quarterbacks that threw the most interceptions last year, the Packers don't play many of them. I mean, the, the highest on this list was Cam Newton with 13 interceptions, um, and then Mitch Trubisky with 12. Philip Rivers also had 12. We're going to play him. Patrick Mahomes also had 12. We're going to play him. So those those Cam Newton, Patrick Mahomes, Mitch Trubisky twice. I guess Eli and Stafford aren't bad either. They had 11. So you got Eli and then you got Stafford twice. But again, it's just being opportunistic. It's about getting that pass rush going and getting a lot of pressure. Big Billy D says 8-8. Eight and eight. It's an appropriate name. Granted, I had the, added the big, but um, he's being one. Anyways... More shots fired, Packers 8-8, eight and eight, whatever. I forget what team, what is it, the Panthers you like or something? Dumb? I actually can't be mad. I, w- I was at his house when the Packers won the Super Bowl and we celebrated together, so I, I'll, I'll leave it alone. We went outside and burned a Pittsburgh Steelers jersey out in his front lawn, so it was a good times. Jacob says three guys with over 10 sacks on the defensive line. Wow. So, let's, all right, let's look at it. So we're, we're looking at... So that's obviously at least 30 sacks just between three guys. So if we say, I don't know, whatever, Zadarius, Preston, and Gary, just for the sake of keeping it simple, the outside linebackers. Then we add in Kyler's sacks, Kenny's sacks, Daniel's sacks, Dean's sacks, you know, all the rest of them. Say combined, you know, so... Actually, that's not that unreasonable. I mean, it's it's not impossible. When you look at last year, the total number of sacks starting at the top, Kansas City had 52, Pittsburgh had 52, Chicago had 50, Minnesota had 50, Saints had 49, 49, 46, 
So even, you know, you get down, I mean, the Packers had 44. If you look at the Chiefs, for example, uh, Chris Jones had 16, D. Ford had 16, Justin Houston had 12. So not only do they have three guys with 10-plus sacks, they were way over. It's not impossible. I mean, you look at Chris Jones, he's kind of a, uh, he's kind of a Kenny Clarkish guy. Mike Daniels, I guess, whatever. D. Ford, I don't know if we have a D. Ford, but if, if, you know, it doesn't have to be 16. If you say Zadarius gets 11, Justin Houston would be, I don't know, Preston. It's not impossible. Now, you did say D. Line. I'm guessing that includes the outside linebackers. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of cheating for you here, but I'm guessing that's one and the same. Yep, <laughs> he wrote it in the comment underneath, including outside linebackers. I mean, it's one of those things where it's it's not impossible and I could see it happening, but just saying it out loud is like, dude, you're being a homer. Just say that it's not going to happen because there's no way. But there is a way. You know, the, the Steelers had two guys, T.J. Watt and Cam Hayward, and uh, Hargrave was a little bit behind. I mean, it, just going through the list, it looks like most teams have just one. Um, I think the Steelers had two, did I say? But the Bears, obviously, was just... Oh, the Vikings also... Uh, no, nope, Vikings just had one. Saints had one. Bears with Khalil Mack just had one. And these are some of the higher-up teams. But the, the reason I kind of can see it happening is if, if you told me the Packers got, let's say, 50 sacks, I just have a hard time picking any one player that got 16, 17, 18 sacks. I just don't see that. If the Packers get to 50, it's because we had several at 10 to 12. I mean, I, I would sooner believe that we had four guys at 10 then I would believe we had one at, like, 18. Because I don't know who that is. I mean, granted, you got to add in, you know, corners getting sacks and safeties getting sacks and linebackers getting sacks. It all adds up, so you still end up... You could still possibly only have two guys over 10 and have, let's say, 50 sacks or whatever. But it doesn't seem... Impo- you know, and, and Preston's in that range. He could get 10-ish. Kyler, obviously, is possible but unlikely, especially with the, the reduction in snap. And, and maybe that's the other problem is the rotation, Makes it a little bit harder, but I think most of these guys... Zadarius is going to be out there most of the time. Kenny and Mike are going to be out there most of the time. Preston's going to be out there probably most of the time. And Gary will be out there most of the time. I know that's more people than there are spots, but, you know, still, most of the time they're going to be out there. More snaps on than off is how I'm defining most. Plenty of opportunities to get yourself 10 sacks in 16 games. Todd says 19-0, and 0, LOL. So... I think the LOL sums that up pretty nicely. It'd be nice, but um, again, my my goal is that 10 mark, and then 12 is sort of like the, whoa, this is a good team. So 19-0 and 0 is, is LOL. That's what that is. The broad strength and depth of the... Oh, sorry, this is Chris in the Facebook group. The broad strength and depth of the Packers pass rush might not yield an elite star, but gives us two or even three all pros in the secondary. So that's kind of what I was saying, but from a, it's sort of a different angle of it so we're gonna have a bunch of guys that are pretty good up front um but they're not necessarily in and of of themselves going to stand out but as a unit they will now my point was as a unit that means we're going to get a lot of pressures a lot of sacks his point is that unit is going to make the defensive back stand out so that was it's all kind of coming together looking back at um garrett's point about the secondary leads the league and takeaways a big part of that, if that happens, is going to be the amount of pressure. So maybe the glory gets all sent to the secondary because look at all the picks. It's got the greatest secondary in the NFL, blah, blah, blah. But really a lot of that has to do with the pass rush. So I could definitely see that being the case. Now, uh, two or three all pros in the secondary? I don't know about that, but maybe if we dial back the, the language a little bit, I could get on board. David says, Jay Sternberger has 50 catches, 650 yards, and three touchdowns. Um, I mean, it's not a Super Bowl. I mean, three touchdowns. I, I I could just sit here and say, yeah, that that sounds about right. That sounds like what a rookie that's a decent contributor contributes, right? It, it's not you come in and you're Travis Kelsey, but you're not just basically sitting on the bench doing nothing, right? You're contri- 650 yards is a lot of yards. It also kind of brings out sort of what I was talking to a friend about where I don't know if Jace is going to be a, a super awesome red zone threat, but you know, up to the 20-yard line, I think that's where he kind of carves it up. So if you're looking at 650 yards, but only three touchdowns, in other words, you're, you're, the ratio to yards and touchdowns feels a little bit low on the touchdown side, in my opinion. If you look at, for example, Devontae, he has double the yards 
but he'll have four times the, that amount of touchdowns. Uh, that would also put him at 13 yards per reception. I don't think that's super unreasonable. I mean, it's high, but that's Mercedes Lewis had 13 yards per reception, as did Travis Kelsey. Um, guys who had higher, Jared Cook, 13.2, Jesse James, 14, Gronk, 14, Vernon Davis, 14, Kittle, 15, Mark Andrews, 16, O.J. Howard, 16. So pretty good company, but uh, let's see, Jimmy Graham had 11.6. But I think this is going to be kind of the, he's he's a receiving tight end, right? That's going to be kind of what he does. So maybe, maybe it'll be a, a, a smidge lower, but I, I think that would be a good a good year, right? Again, he's not Travis Kelsey getting 1,300 yards, but you know, it was pretty similar to what Jared Cook had last year. Which I mean, if you can be Jared Cook in Oakland, that's not bad. 68 receptions, 896 yards, uh, six touchdowns. So. 18 more receptions, a decent amount more yards, and double the touchdowns. Let's see, what would be a better? Vance McDonald, 50 receptions, 610 yards, and four touchdowns. So he's Vance McDonald. I'm all right with that year one. Mike says, Clark becomes the most dominant player on the defense and becomes a top two defensive tackle in the league. I think Clark already is the most dominant player on the defense, so that's already a satisfied um, requirement. Top two, man, you, you guys are always just, I mean, because cause Aaron Donald's number one. So basically, he's the best defensive tackle not named Aaron Donald. Um, Some competition, man. I think it's doable. He, I think he's just got to get the, the pressures up. The sack number in particular has got to come up a little bit. Six sacks just isn't quite cutting it. Aaron Donald with 21. Chris Jones, Kansas City. That's going to be some tough competition being better than him. He had 16. DeForest Buckner for the 49ers had 13. Fletcher Cox had 11. Uh, Jerron Reed in Seattle had 11. Cam Hayward with Pittsburgh had 11. Um, you know, so I, I think he's got to have a minimum of 10 sacks. If we're going to say he's number two, minimum 10 sacks. Uh, beyond that, his play stands, stay, you know, it, it speaks for itself. He's a dominant, dominant. I mean, he's better than DeForest Buckner. He's better than Jerron Reed. Um, you know, he didn't have the sacks. But again, get those 10 plus sack numbers, then let the tape speak for itself. And I think he's got a chance, but that's a, that's a big hill to climb right there. Jason says, special teams wins a couple games instead of losing a few. What a way to end it right there on special teams, huh? That would be nice, though. I mean, it, special teams has been nothing but a liability. It would be nice to have a couple games, you know, fourth quarter, a minute 13 left, Packers down by two points, and you got Trevor Davis catching the ball at the five-yard line, and he gets a 52-yard return. You know, something to that effect, and then Mason Crosby closes, closes it out with a field goal. You know, those kinds of things where special teams units on the opposing side look at the Packers special teams and go, okay, we have to figure out how to make this work to our... In other words, instead of we got to make sure we kick it to their guy because more bad things are going to come than good, they're looking at make sure he doesn't touch it. You know, oh no, the Packers special teams has control of the situation is sort of the what we're looking for. So I'm, I'm very, very hopeful. I don't know. And I, I couldn't even begin to guess what our new special teams coordinator is going to do, positive or negative. But I, I just think a loaf of bread could do just about as well as what we've been seeing the last year, two years, three years, whatever, um, on special teams. So anyways, that's about it. I'm going to get out of here. I got some stuff to do. I got work to do. You folks, enjoy your Friday. Feels like Sunday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.